Good morning, this is Aaron with Transformed by His Truth. I was looking through some articles today and I found one that talks about a woman who was uh, a prisoner of Hamas during this war and how she was treated and what they did to her and how we need to be aware that this could be happening to the remaining hostages that are still in Hamas's grip. Um, so I'm going to read this article and hopefully it'll give you an idea of Hamas and how they operate and that they don't want peace. They don't want peace with Israel. They want the destruction of the Israeli people so that they can take over Israel for themselves. This is a this is a, a several thousand year old battle that started with uh, the well I won't go into that because that'll take too long but anyway I'll start reading this this article um, an Israeli hostage recounted for the first time in extensive interviews how she was repeatedly assaulted during her 55 days in captivity. Amit Susana is the first former hostage to publicly speak out about the sexual and physical abuse she suffered at the hands of her captors in Gaza, according to the New York Times. Susana told the outlet that she had decided to speak out now in an effort to raise awareness about the struggles faced by the hostages, more than 100 of whom still remain trapped in Gaza. On October 7th, Susana was taken from her closet in Kafar Ava Kibbutz and dragged into Gaza by at least 10 men who repeatedly tackled her to the ground as they struggled to restrain her. She told the Times her captors beat her and wrapped her in white fabric until they eventually bound her hands and feet and took her into Gaza. I didn't want to let them take me to Gaza like an object without a fight, Susana told the Times. I still kept believing that someone will come and rescue me. Sosana described to the Times being detained at roughly half a dozen sites, including private homes, an office in a subterranean tunnel. But her first stop was a luxur luxury private home where she was watched by a guard who called himself Muhammad. The Israeli lawyer said he repeatedly started asking her about her sex life and when her period was due while she was held alone in a child's bedroom and chained by her left ankle. She said she would sometimes sit beside that he would sometimes sit beside her on the bed, lift her shirt, and touch her. Then on the morning of October 24th, Muhammad unchained her from the bed and led her to the bathroom, where she undressed and began washing herself in the tub. Before she was finished, he returned and stood in the doorway holding a pistol. He came towards me and shoved the gun at my forehead, Susanna said during her Times interview. He then hit her, forcing her to remove her towel, groped her, sat her on the edge of the bed and hit her again. I'm sorry, hit, sat her on the edge of the bathtub and hit her again. He sat me on the edge of the bath and I closed my legs and I resisted and he kept punching me and put his gun in my face, Susanna said. Then he, with the gun pointed at me, forced me to commit a sexual act on him, she recalled. After the assault, she told the Times that she was left sitting naked in the dark, but when Muhammad returned, she said he showed remorse, saying, I'm bad, I'm bad, please don't tell Israel. That doesn't sound like remorse. That sounds like he's scared of being caught by Israel. That's not remorse. That's fear. Uh, you can't stand looking at him, but you have to. He's the one who's protecting you. He's your guard, she recalled. You're there with him, and you know that every moment it can happen again. You're completely dependent on him. She was later transferred to another private apartment, where she said guards wrapped her head in a pink shirt, forced her to sit on the floor, handcuffed her, and began beating her with the butt of a gun. After several minutes, they used duct tape to cover her mouth and nose, tied her feet, and placed the handcuffs on the base of her palms, she said. She also described being suspended hanging like a chicken from a stick stretching between the gap of two couches while they beat her. She recalled being in so much pain that she felt her hands might be dislocated. They beat the soles of her feet while simultaneously demanding information they claimed she was hiding from them. It was like that for 45 minutes or so, she told the Times. They were hitting me and laughing and kicking me and called the other hostages to see me. Then the kidnappers untied her and took her to the, be to the bedroom where the before they told her she had 40 minutes to produce the information they wanted or they would kill her. Susana was released from captivity on Thursday, November 30th and was reportedly badly wounded, suffering from fractures in her right eye socket, cheek, knee, and nose, as well as severe bruising on her knee and back. The report stated that several injuries were related to her abduction on October 7th, including punches to her right eye. 
Hamas and its supporters repeatedly deny that its members sexually abuse hostages in captivity or victims of the October 7th terrorist attack. But earlier this month, the United Nations issued a report finally recognizing that they had found clear and convincing information that sexual violence, including rape, sexualized torture, cruel and inhuman, inhumane, and degrading treatment had been committed against hostages. The report was carried out by Pramila Patton, a special representative of the Secretary General, who also highlighted that there were reasonable grounds to believe that such violence may be ongoing against those still held in captivity. The mission team also found a pattern of victims, mostly women, found fully or partially naked, bound and shot across multiple lo locations. Patton said, adding that although circumstantial, such a pattern may be indicative of some forms of sexual violence, including sexualized torture, cruel, inhumane, and degrading treatment. That's the end of that article. I know that's pretty heavy duty, but it's talking about what happened to this this hostage and what Hamas is capable of. You don't hear people um, that are being held by by uh, the, uh, by the IDF that they're being sexually abused or physically abused. This is this is good against evil. This is an old battle that goes back millennium back to. Um, I want to say uh, Isaac and Ishmael. Isaac was the promised son of Abraham by God when Sarah was 90 years old. Uh, Sarah and Abraham didn't want to wait for God's promise, so they went and had Abraham sleep with a chambermaid that was from the Arabs, and they produced Ishmael. So Ishmael was technically the firstborn son who the, the inheritance usually goes to the firstborn son in Jewish tradition. But this was not the promised son of God. The promised son was going to be Isaac. So when Isaac was born, he was considered the firstborn son because he was of God's doing, not of Abraham and Sarah's doing behind God's back. Um, so from that day forward, you have... Isaac and Ishmael at at odds with each other. You have Isaac the the um, from the Israeli side and from the the Jewish side, and then you have Ishmael from the Arab side. And it's been ever since that happened, ever since the the inheritance was given to Isaac instead of Ishmael. Ishmael has always wanted to take back what he thinks is his inheritance. Even though he was not the firstborn son from God, he was the firstborn son from the what the what Abraham and Sarah did, but that did not uh, make him eligible to be the one to receive the inheritance. So you've got these two two brothers who one is the father of the Jews, not the father of the Jews. One is the leader of the Jews, and one is the leader of the Arabs. And so you have uh, God put away. Ishmael and the handmaiden and gave them lots of money, lots of cattle, lots of stuff so they could go start their own land. They could go start their own people in another land. So they were basically kicked out because they were not from God's promise. And ever since then, you've got Isaac and Ishmael's people fighting and uh, warring over who gets the inheritance and who gets who gets to have the land Jerusalem and all that and technically it belongs to Isaac's people which is the Jews because it was God's promise to Abraham and Sarah that their their son Isaac would get the inheritance not Ishmael so anyway this is a this has got a lot more detail to what's going on but you've got to to this day you've got the Arabs and the Jews at odds with each other and the Arabs constantly beating down and trying to destroy the Jews they don't want to live side by side with the Jews they want the elimination of the Jews so they can take over what they think is their land so there'll never be peace a true peace with Hamas or Hezbollah or any other terrorist group even the uh, the Arabs in general most of those are so inundated with the wrong information and and, and programmed to believe that Israel and the Israeli people are their enemies that most of them most of the young men end up turning into terrorists because they don't want to because they think they want to get back land that doesn't actually belong to them so we're talking about an age-old battle that will end with the culmination of the 
Antichrist trying to say that he's God in the second in the third temple that will be built during the tribulation and God coming back and taking back what belongs to him Jesus will come back and he will kick out the Antichrist from the temple he will turn everyone away from the Antichrist and he will um, take over as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords so there's a lot more to this story but basically it's two people two peoples that are that are fighting for the same thing one has the right to the inheritance which is Isaac's people and Ishmael's people who have land of their own but they can't stand the fact that they don't have Israel so even though they've got the most of the Middle East is Arab and belonging to the Arabs they can't stand the fact that they don't have Israel so they're going to continually and constantly fight for what they think is theirs which is not and the Jews are constantly defending themselves against these people who want to destroy them so it's important to understand why Netanyahu doesn't want a two-state solution because he knows that the, the Arabs do not want peace. He knows that the Arabs want the destruction of the Israeli people. And that's why he's pushing so hard against a two-state solution. And so we're going to have what's happening right now is the whole world is turning against Israel. Even the America, the United States has taken her hand off of Israel and, and is trying to force her into a two-state solution. So this is not going to happen. God said Jerusalem will never be divided. And so we've got Israel on her, basically on her own now with no allies trying to defend herself against elimination and destruction and annihilation. I mean you can't blame the people there for trying to, to protect what's theirs and just they just want to exist. They don't want to. They don't want to have to fight off other people. They don't want to have to be at war, but they have to do that in order to protect what's theirs. So, there's a lot more to this story. But just remember, when you're watching and listening to what's going on between the terrorists, or Hamas, or Hezbollah, or whoever, and Israel, you know the reason behind it is one brother thought that he was supposed to get the inheritance, and the other brother legally and spiritually was. Uh, given his inheritance. And God didn't send away Ishmael with nothing. He sent him away enough with enough cattle and money and people to start their own their own uh, existence. They could just go off and start their own lives somewhere else. And that's what they did. And ever since then, they've been at war with Israel, trying to take back that little bit of land that isn't theirs. So... Um, as you watch this war continue, you under this maybe help you understand why Israel has to go into Rafah because it's where the strongholds of the leaders of Hezbollah and Hamas are, and they need to get in there and get rid of those leaders and get rid of those fighters. Uh, Israel is is so compassionate towards the, the people, not the leadership and not the terrorists, but the people of these cities. That they they drop leaflets warning them to get out of the city before they're going to attack. They don't just go in and attack and kill a bunch of civilians. They give them a time to try and get out of there. So even just temporarily until they can take care of what they need to be doing there, which is getting the terrorists. So anyway, um, just remember when you're watching this and you're thinking that Netanyahu is being selfish or or uh, not cooperating. There's a reason why. He's trying to keep the existence of his people alive. But the Bible does say that in the end times that the whole world will turn against Israel and that's where we are right now. America took her hand off of Israel and is trying, like I said, trying to force her into a two-state solution just like everybody else. And that's when Israel's all on her own and uh, we're very close to the rapture because the rapture of the church will happen before the Antichrist is revealed and before a lot of this stuff happens. So if you're not saved, if you're on the edge or on the fence or you're not sure what you should be doing, you need to get saved today by trusting in the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. You need to understand that Jesus Christ already did everything necessary to save your soul from the hell. He already did everything to for the forgiveness of your sins. He shed his precious blood to cleanse you from all your sin and to make you righteous before God. But you must place your faith and your trust and your belief 
in what Jesus did on that cross. There's no work involved that you can do with it. You Getting baptized doesn't matter. Getting uh, Keeping the, com the commandments doesn't matter. Keeping the sacraments doesn't matter. Trying to be a better person, turning from your sin, this and that and the other thing. None of that matters. All that matters is what you put your faith and trust and belief in. And if you put it in, the, in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, which I'll read to you here, then you shall be saved. You will be saved. You'll be saved from the upcoming tribulation period that's right around the corner. You'll be raptured out of here before that happens. You'll be with Jesus forever, who loves you more than anything. What he put up with and what he tolerated and, and had to go through from the time he entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday until the time that they crucified him uh, was terrible. They, they beat him. They tortured him. They, they just... He was so bloodied even before he went to the cross. And then he went to the cross for the, the most cruel and unusual way of death. And he did that for us. He hung there and died and shed all his blood so that we could be saved for free. We don't have to earn our salvation. He earned it for us. He did the ultimate sacrifice which the Father required so that, he, that we could be saved. So please, I pray that you'll place your faith and trust in the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, which I'll read right now. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, and which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He died by shedding his blood, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James and of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, and I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. So not only did he die for our sins, he was buried and rose again according to the scriptures, he came back and showed himself to people after he resurrected. They've got all these witnesses and people that saw him, and then he and then he went back to heaven, and then when he called Paul on the road to Damascus, he spoke with Paul and gave him the teaching, the doctrine, the requirements for the body of Christ, which is different from the Jews and their requirements. He gave us his death, burial, and resurrection alone to save us from our sins. So I pray that you will put your faith and trust in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. It's how that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried and he rose again, according to the scriptures. He fulfilled so many scriptures. It's not even mathematically possible for Jesus to have fulfilled all the scriptures that were written about him in the Old Testament if it was he was anything other than God. So I pray that today you would think hard about where you stand because we are on the verge of the rapture of the body of Christ, which is when God's going to take us out of this world. He's going, Jesus is going to meet us in the air. He will not put his feet on the ground yet. He's going to meet us in the air. We're going to meet him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Jesus will put his feet down on the Mount of Olives when he comes back after the end of the seven-year tribulation. Jesus will come and come back to earth, but he will not come back to earth for the rapture. We will meet him in the air. So there's so much to, to learn and to know. And another thing that's really important is knowing how to rightly divide scripture. If we try to apply all scripture to our lives, we're getting very confused, messed up, and trying to figure out why does this say one thing and this says another. It doesn't, God's word is perfect. It, the problem is us. When we don't rightly divide, when we try to apply scripture meant for Jews, to ourselves, then we become, uh, we have problems, we have confusion, we have technicalities. It's, it's a mess. So when you rightly divide the word of truth, this means that you place 
your well, that's not really the right way to say that. You you don't try to put scripture meant for other groups of people on your own life. We don't we don't go by the Old Testament rules and regulations. So why would we go by the 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 Jewish way of being saved before Jesus died? So many people get confused because they don't realize that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and John and other books in the New Testament are written to Jews. So that's why people say when we follow Paul, our apostle, who Jesus chose himself, that we ha we get our doctrine, we get our teaching, we get our rules and what we're supposed to do from Romans through Philemon. Doesn't mean that we don't read the rest of the Bible. Of course we read the rest of the Bible. The Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tell about Jesus and all the things that he did and who he was. So 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 is a culmination of what Jesus did and who he was and what he did for us so that once you put in place your faith and trust in the gospel that Paul calls, calls it the gospel, then you're saved. You don't have to worry about being here for the tribulation period, which is going to be the worst time in the world on this earth. And... You will be with the Lord forever. You won't have to worry about going to the lake of fire at the end of all this chaos and the end of the end of time when God will judge all men. He will bring all, all he will bring all people that have ever lived before him, and they will have an, a chance to give an account of their lives, and he will have the books open that have recorded everything that they ever did, and including the times that he tried to reach them. And those people are not going to be like, oh, well, you never did this or you never did that. They're going to be like, okay, Lord, I realize and I see how you tried to reach me and I didn't I didn't listen. I didn't trust Jesus Christ for what he did for me. And then he will, then they will hear, depart from me, I never knew you. And you don't want to hear that. You don't want to hear God himself, the creator of all things, say, I depart from me, I never knew you. You want him to say, hear, see you and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And the way to do that is to place your faith and trust and belief in, again, in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, how that Christ died for our sins by shedding his perfect holy blood. That he died, he was buried, and he rose again, according to the scriptures. If you place your faith and trust in that alone, then you will be saved. So I pray today that you will. I pray that you'll look deep inside your heart and see the truth. We all know we're sinners. We all know whether or not we're truly saved, we all know deep in our hearts the right what is the right thing to do because God gave us a conscience and that conscience is well aware of the Creator and His creation. And we will be without excuse if we reject the free gift that He gave to us by giving us His only Son, His only begotten Son, so that we could be with Him. That's how much God loves us is that He did all that so that we could be with Him again, His creation. So I pray today that you will get saved. I pray if you did, thank God. You're ready to go to heaven. You're ready to be raptured. And if you haven't, I pray that you'll take seriously God's warnings and see that we're the world is on the brink of war. We all know it. We all see that countries are only getting along because they have to. Otherwise, we'd annihilate each other. We're, everybody's got their finger on the nuclear button. Just waiting for the there are there are crazy despots like Kim Jong Un in North Korea who's crazy who probably set off one of the nukes when you know I don't know when he will but he probably will he's such a crazy person and then you have other countries China Russia they're not our allies they're not our friends they they want to destroy the America America America's got problems too she is not loved by the world she is trying to stand up for what's right and do what's right and as she was protecting Israel she was doing that and we had protection but now that she's taken her hand off of Israel and said that or was trying to force her into a two-state solution we have this eclipse coming that in 2017 put an at one line over the middle of America over all of America but across the middle and then this April 8th eclipse coming is going to put another X over or another line over America, and it's going to form a big X. And it's going to go through cities called Nineveh and a city called Rapture. 
I mean, these things you can't make up. They're, it's, it's incredible how God uses what he uses to try and get our attention. But anyway, since we took our hand off Israel, we're going to have a big X on this country. And I don't know if that means we're done for. But because we've, we're trying to force Israel to do something that she's not supposed to do, we're becoming very vulnerable and who knows what's going to happen. So it's best to get saved now because who knows if we're not going to get nuked, you know. I mean, we're not part of biblical prophecy, so who knows what's going to happen to us. So anyway, the most important thing is, is to get saved. Get you saved, get your family saved. Try to get people to understand that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And that no man cometh to the Father but by Him. So I pray that you would get saved today. I pray that um, you'll think seriously about these things that are going on. And how these uh, terrorists treated this woman. And I'm sure she wasn't the only one that was treated, you know, horribly and, and abused and sexually abused and tortured. There must, uh, Who knows what they're doing to the last hundred uh, hostages that are left if they're even alive. So... Now we've got um, them talking about that they're not going to give back the hostages and that they still demand a ceasefire. So it's a mess right now. And the only way it's going to be fixed is by when Jesus comes back at the end of the seven-year tribulation. But before that, after the rapture, the Antichrist will be revealed and the world will follow him gladly because he's going to have all the answers seemingly. He's going to be able to do miracles and wonders and people are going to be fooled because they didn't listen to the truth. And because they believed a lie, God will send them strong delusion so that they will believe a lie. And so we got to get into the Bible and read it and see what it says in order to know what's coming. The Bible is very relevant for today. It's very um, detailed. It's very relevant. And, and what goes on in the Bible is what goes on in this world. So I want to suggest uh, a great teacher, Robert Breaker of thecloudchurch.org. He's got videos and information on every subject you could think of. He's a pastor who has been right on about everything that he's been preaching for the last eight years I've been listening to him. And he just, he tells it like it is. He doesn't compromise. He knows how to rightly divide. He understands dispensations. He understands um, how to teach and preach the Bible. So I pray that I'm going to link that here. I'll link this article. I'm going to link Robert's website. And uh, I hope that you'll go to that website and, and check it out because it's got answers to almost everything you could ask about spiritually. So I pray you would. And I hope you have a good day. And I thank you for coming to my channel. And I thank you for any comments or subscriptions. Um, I'm still working on trying to figure out why people can't leave comments on my channel. I've tried to figure out every which way on YouTube to get them to come through. So don't get discouraged if your comments don't don't um, post. It's not you. It's me. I'm trying to figure out what else to do <laughs> to get this to work. So hopefully I'll figure it out soon. Anyway, I hope you have a good day. And I thank you for coming to my channel. Bye-bye.